17, with this being one of the shortest verses of the Bible, don't think that this will be one of the shortest messages that I preach. It just won't happen that way. But usually the shorter the verse, the longer the message. But 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, and we're going to talk tonight about the priority of praying. You know that many people don't make prayer a priority. It's not a priority in their life whatsoever. Uh, they pray when they come to church, and that's about it. Or they'll pray over their meal. Or they may uh, kneel by their kid's bed before they go to sleep and say a prayer. Uh, but very few people make prayer a priority. But let's look here. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. I want to make sure you're there because I'll have it read before you even get there as short as it is. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing ceasing a breath, as breathing is necessary for physical life so prayer is essential to the spiritual life it's so important that paul instructed us here in this verse to do just that pray without ceasing what is that in other places that pray always praying is a priority why is prayer a priority prayer is a priority because it expresses our worship for god it moves god to act and then it deepens our relationship to God. It causes us to grow spiritually, and it allows us to participate in the mission of God. That sounds a whole lot more uh, than give me, right? That's, that sounds a whole lot more than God I need. Therefore, prayer should be, and praying should be, a priority for every individual Christian and for every church. Amen? Amen? We, we say amen. Many say amen to that. But you know what the least attended meeting in the church is? Prayer meeting. You know how many times people run out the door in the morning? Maybe you're not a morning person, but they run out the door in the morning and they don't pray. That's okay because maybe you pray at night, but then you're so tired at night, you go to sleep and you still haven't prayed. So you had no communication with God. So before you know it, you've gone through a whole day not doing God's will. Because if you haven't prayed, you didn't know His will. You're doing your own thing. And that's what many do. So we're going to talk about that tonight, the priority of praying. Father, we love you. Thank you. Praise you that you are the strength that we need, the hope that we need, the help that we need. All of our help comes from the Lord. And we know that prayer is just as big as you are. Prayer connects us to you. Prayer is our lifeline to you. Prayer is our access by one spirit into the holy of holies. And I pray, Father God, that you just help us tonight. Anoint me to, to deliver this word and anoint hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Prayer, praying is a priority because it expresses our worship to God. It moves God to act. It deepens our relationship to God. It causes us to grow spiritually, and it allows us, this is my favorite part, it allows us to participate in the mission of God. I want to be right in the middle of what God is doing. So in order to be right in the middle of what God is doing, that has to be revealed to us, uh, and that is only revealed uh, through prayer. Uh, God uh, only moves. I'm, I'm firmly convinced that the only time that God moves uh, is in a direct response to prayer. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because Scripture says you have not because you ask not. He tells us how powerful uh, our prayer is and uh, that we can move uh, mountains and we can do all of these great things. Listen to what he said in Matthew 6, 5 and 6. Jesus speaking here. Uh, he said, when thou prayest. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Uh, look in verse 6. But thou, again, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Uh, now we look at both of those verses, and in both of those verses, what do we notice uh, there? We notice these three words, uh, when thou prayest. Did you see that? 
Did you, did you see, verse 5, if you've got your Bible open tonight, uh, you can look. Uh, is it possible, Sister Amy, to put 5 and 6 both up on the screen at the same time? Uh, uh, to see that so we can see this, uh, in both of these verses, Jesus speaking here, uh, he says, when thou prayest. We've got to notice that because notice there that it's not if thou prayest. Why is that? Because prayer is not optional for Christians. It's not an option. Jesus is saying it's not an option. It's not uh, if you pray, if you feel like praying, uh, but when you pray, what does that mean? It means that prayer uh, is a priority uh, to a Christian. Just as I started off by saying tonight, uh, just as breathing is essential to the physical man, uh, prayer is essential to the spiritual man. Uh, So in essence, prayer is the breath uh, that you and I as Christians must breathe. Uh, Notice that prayer was a priority throughout the Word of God in the Old Testament. And some say, well, we don't live by the Old Testament anymore. Well, prayer was a priority in the New Testament too. So it's covered. Uh, Praying is a priority in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, Did you know that the Bible records more than 650 prayers? Beginning with Genesis 4 and 26, uh, it says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And ending with John's prayer uh, in Revelations 22 and 20, uh, Even so come Lord Jesus. Uh, In between those two prayers uh, was some 650 prayers. Uh, What does that tell us? Uh, Prayer is a priority uh, throughout the Word of God. So if it's a priority uh, throughout the Word of God, what do we call this? It's our blueprint, right? It's our instruction manual. It's, uh, one person said Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. It's kind of our manual as Christians. When when you get saved, uh, they tell you if you don't have a Bible, get one. Well, anytime I lead somebody to the Lord, I ask them, uh, do you have a Bible? If you don't have a Bible, I can get you a Bible because it's important uh, that you do two things from this moment on. Uh, number one, read the Word of God. Number two, uh, pray every day. Pray often. Uh, matter of fact, Paul said, pray without ceasing. Uh, prayer is the priority that we have. Uh, so we see if it's a priority there, it should be a priority here. Uh, when, when we notice when these uh, men, women, uh, boys and girls throughout the Word of God, when they made prayer a priority, uh, the Lord answered. Uh, Jeremiah spoke of it, uh, and many of the prophets spoke of it. Uh, when they prayed that it was a priority, and they began to see things happen uh, when they prayed. Uh, It was established early in Scripture uh, that the temple, or what we know, the church, uh, he said that my house uh, shall be called a house of prayer. House of prayer. Not a house of whatever people have made it, but a house of prayer. A place of prayer. A place that not only prayers go up, but a place where heaven responds. Isn't that what church is all about? Uh, that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with prayer, uh, praise. Uh, listen, each one of us come into the house of God. Uh, we've got a prayer in our heart. Uh, you know what? I believe uh, that the prayer in the sanctuary should be, uh, it should be a continuation of what we've already been praying in our prayer closet. Uh, a prayer in the sanctuary uh, is an expectation uh, of what we've already been talking to God about. Uh, in our uh, uh, individual time of prayer. And we come together uh, with men and women. Uh, Brother Paul's been over there in his prayer closet uh, praying for revival. Uh, Brother Jeremy's been over there in his prayer closet praying for revival. Uh, Brother jo- George and Brother Kevin and, uh, and Brother Laney and others, uh, Sister Gilda, we've been praying in our own uh, places. I don't know exactly what he's praying over there or what he's praying over there, uh, but some aspects we've come together in agreement uh, and said let's pray on these things Uh, we're all praying for breakthrough right 
You're praying for breakthrough in your prayer closet. You're praying for it. Uh, We're praying for exponential growth. Uh, We're praying that God would save our lost loved ones. Uh, I'm praying for your lost family. Uh, You're praying for my lost family. Uh, We're praying for sick bodies to be healed. Uh, We're we're doing that uh, in our homes. Uh, We've got a prayer list and we've got a prayer life. Uh, So for me, what I believe, uh, that when we enter into the sanctuary, uh, we're not only offering up a continuation of that prayer, but we come with an anticipation and an expectation to believe that it's here that heaven's going to rain down. It is here when we gather together that healings will take place. Salvation will take place. Prayer is not a one-way conversation. So when we come into the temple, it's not only a place that prayers go up. I know we we say, I got a prayer request. Pray with me about this or pray with me about that. But it's also a place where the answers come down. Now, God can rain down the answer to prayer anywhere. God can answer a prayer right in the middle of Walmart. You can say, Lord, this is too much. I want it for cheaper. And you find that it's on the clearance rack. God can do that. But mostly where God is answering prayer at is right here. The house of prayer. The very place people say they don't need anymore. Oh, I need the church. I I need the church. I I not just need this building. Uh, uh, This is God's house. Uh, There's just something about the tabernacle. Uh, There's just something about uh, the the coming into the house of God. Uh, So I need to come to this building. Uh, You need to come to this building. Uh, Why? Because in this building uh, is where the church is found. Uh, Oh, this is the church house. Uh, But look to your right and look to your left. Uh, That's the church. Uh, You're the church. We're the church Uh, we're the body of christ members in particular Uh, so right here within this vessel uh, prayers go up and heaven responds most familiar verses on prayers found in second chronicles 7 and 14 but has anybody ever read past 14 if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray seek my face and turn from their wicked ways Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We know that part, right? Verse 15, now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house uh, that my name uh, may be there forever. And mine eyes uh, and my heart shall be there uh, perpetually. Uh, Do you notice what happened there? Uh, Do you notice? You can find this in several Old Testament scriptures. A lot of the Psalms uh, have this. Uh, There's a shift from the writer. Uh, uh, making a statement to God responding. In verse 14, uh, is God saying, if my people, uh, he's given out a command, shall humble themselves and pray. Uh, but then God says what he will do in verse 15 and 16, uh, that he is going to uh, do a work there in the midst. Uh, why? Uh, because prayer is a priority. God says, I respond to prayer. I don't feel like praying. Well, God says, I don't feel like responding then. I I don't feel like talking to the Lord. I'm mad at God. Well, get over it. He's the only way that we have. He is the only way of escape. He is the only answer. And one songwriter said, he ain't ever done me nothing but good. So if you think God did you wrong, you're wrong. Because God never fails. God never fails. He's never come up short. Uh, You know, Brother Jeremy, the times that I thought God failed me, I realized I was wrong. I failed. I missed the mark. I was disobedient. Uh, I disobeyed his word. I tried to do it my way, uh, and God didn't approve of my way, so that made me upset. Because I wanted to do it the way I want. I know none of you has never been that way. uh, But that is where I found myself. uh, And the bottom line is this. uh, God is never wrong. He's always right. Prayer. What is, who is, who is our great example in Scripture? It's Jesus. The Word became flesh to dwell among us to set an example. We know that he came to die to be resurrected. We know he came for all that, but he also came as God in the flesh to say, this is how you do it. 
Because y'all haven't been doing it right for centuries. That's basically what God was saying. The prophets, they've messed it up. The priests, they've, all of them. Elijah's hiding in caves and, and all of these. He said, none of man has come. And from Adam all the way back. And, and they're listening to snakes and eating fruit that I told them to leave alone. And they're going down there and... Samson's going down there messing with women, knows that he's not even supposed to be down there. He's got a, he's got a vow that he's not even supposed to be in that place. Uh, he goes down to a grape orchard, uh, and he's not even supposed to even mess with grapes. Uh, but there he is. Why? Because some woman. Uh, and then we have this and that throughout the Old Testament. Uh, so finally, uh, after 400 years of silence, uh, God says we've got to do something different. And John recorded it, uh, that the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Uh, God says, I am here. Uh, how, how, what do you mean God says, I am here? Uh, he said, his name shall be called Emmanuel, uh, God with us. Uh, and so Jesus came as God with us, uh, but Jesus came as God, uh, but he also came as man. Uh, it's a phenomenon that nobody can figure out, uh, that he was 100% God, uh, yet he was 100% man. Uh, he was 100% God uh, for a purpose. Uh, because he came uh, to be our uh, our sacrificial lamb. Uh, that's who he was. That's why he came. Uh, but he came as 100% man uh, to say, why I am here for these 33 and a half years. Let me show you how you can live a life without sin. Right? Of Hebrews says he would all points tempted as you and I, yet without sin. How did he do that? Because some would say he was God. No, he was 100% man. He was flesh and blood. When they beat him, it hurt. His sweat became as great drops of blood. He was in agony and pain so much, even before he went to the cross, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Jesus, the man, he suffered. He went through uh, ridicule and persecution. He told his disciples, I, I don't even have a place to lay my head. And he, he, he set out all of that, but yet he did it without sinning. Yet he did it without sinning. And we want the stake to claim that I'm just an old sinner, saved by grace. Well, everybody got to sin a little bit every day, not Jesus. Why well, ain't Jesus? I'm not Jesus. Well, Paul said it's no longer I, but Christ that lives in me. That's why we keep sinning, because we ain't Jesus. We ain't trying to be like Jesus. Uh, if we was trying to be like Jesus, we'd quit sinning. We'd stop sinning. How, how in the world did Jesus the man do it? Uh, how did he do it? How did these men uh, live uh, a life that was dedicated and committed and submitted? Uh, how was Job a perfect and an upright man? How did his very shadow bring conviction? Uh, how did Jesus uh, do that? Well, it's very simple. Uh, prayer was a priority in the life of Jesus. Jesus would often find a secluded place where he would commune with his heavenly Father. Luke 5 and 16 tells us that. He prayed all night before he appointed his 12 disciples. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Jesus taught his disciples that prayer was a priority for the individual believer and for the church. His disciples, when they began to look at all the things that Jesus did, this always fascinated me. They watched him raise people from the dead. Jesus never went to a funeral. Not one person has ever told me of the funeral that Jesus has gone to that he left, the person was still dead, because it never happened. He never, he raised the dead. Woman with an issue of blood, as Brother Paul preached, I believe it was. Was it you to preach that? So many people's preached over the last week. I can't remember who preached what, but it was all good. That he didn't even touch her, she touched him. What do you mean, who touched you? Yeah, I felt virtue. He stopped the show. He stopped everything. Twelve years, boom, gone. He watches, uh, they watched as he stood at the tomb of a guy that had been dead uh, for four days, said, Lazarus, come forth. With no expectation that the dead guy was going to come bouncing out of the grave. But that wasn't good enough. He was still in grave clothes, and he said, be loosed, uh, and the grave clothes fell at his feet. 
Next thing you know, Lazarus is there uh, with him at a meal. Uh, they watched another time. He steps onto an island, and this man that's full of demons, thousands of demons, legions, uh, comes and falls down at his feet, uh, and he's healed. Uh, he's delivered. Uh, and the next thing we read about that man in Scripture says he was at the feet of Jesus, clothed, uh, and in his right mind. They, they see all of that. I could go on and on and on and on for what the disciples saw. But when it came time for them to ask something of Jesus, they didn't ask, hey, teach me to do this and teach me to do that. But they knew that the priority, they knew that the greatest emphasis, they knew the answer. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Why? Because prayer raises the dead. Prayer is what causes a dead man to come to life. Prayer is what causes sickness to be healed. Prayer brings that anointing upon one's life. If someone but touches them, they are healed. He gave that emphasis on the priority of prayer. It was uttered as a powerful scene unfolded in Mark chapter 11, verse 17, when he said this, he proclaimed this. Is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer, but you've made it the den of thieves? He knew that merchandising would not, was, he knew there that merchandising would not, and without prayer the church could not fulfill its mission in the world. He was saying that, that you're doing, that going to the merchants and setting up a flea market in the church. See, God turned over tables for that. And they're thinking that we'll, we'll just use it as a, as a place. And, 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 they're going, and what really got him is when he looked over there and he saw all those doves. And that set him off. Because doves were not just a sacrifice. Doves were a representation of the Holy Ghost. And, and he knew that, that there, there was nothing. Uh, I believe it was David. Uh, it may have been Abraham that said this. I believe both of them actually said it. I will not offer to God nothing uh, that did not cost me something. That's paraphrasing, of course. But both of those men said that. Uh, and he is saying here uh, that this, it's not a, uh, a cheap gospel. It's not a cheap sacrifice. Uh, it's not a place. He said this isn't a place of merchandising. Uh, without prayer, the church cannot fulfill the mission. Uh, merchandising is not going to cause us to fulfill the mission of the church. It's not going to happen. Marketing, uh, our name, and uh, having our brand. Everybody wants to have a brand. Uh, oh, I think all of that is important. I think advertising is important. I think all of those things are important. Uh, but Jesus said, do not. Uh, do not merchandise within this temple. Uh, he said, you're making the disgrace of it. Uh, and so we realize that Jesus showed them there uh, that the only way that we fulfill the mission of the world, to the church, to the world, is through the priority of praying. Jesus set that example. So therefore, what does Scripture tell us after Jesus is resurrected and back at the right hand of the Father? Scripture points back to us at that point, at the church. It says, you, talking to the church, not talking to this building, not talking to that light up there, or this pulpit, or this platform, or that piano, or this carpet. He said, you. Who, me? Yeah, you. You are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. But wait a minute, a few minutes ago you just told me you ain't Jesus. You are the body of Christ. We are his ambassadors. There's a change that's taking place. See, the problem, uh, I believe that the reason people fall into sin so quickly uh, is we don't realize who we are. Uh, I'm not calling us little gods. I'm not saying uh, we're little miniature Jesus uh, running around here. But what I am telling you uh, is Scripture says that after Jesus went to be at the right hand of the Father, uh, he looked at the church and said, the church, uh, that you are the body of Christ, uh, members in particular, that you make up the body of Christ. Uh, and so with that being known, uh, when we begin to read it about that early church, uh, that early church, uh, that, that New uh, Testament church, uh, uh, does not even bear a resemblance to the church of the day. There's no comparison. That, that church was powerful. They saw souls added daily. They, they prayed uh, and things happened. 
Prayer, why? Because praying was a priority for the early church. Prayer was a vital part of worship in the early church. The preparation for the uh, outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2 uh, started uh, in Acts chapter 1 verse 14 uh, with this. Listen, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. After Pentecost, uh, prayer continued to be a priority uh, to the early church. Acts 2.42, uh, and they continued steadfastly uh, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowships and in breaking of bread and in prayers. It was a priority. Uh, the, the apostles, uh, they attended daily prayer services in the temple. Uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 4. Uh, Acts chapter 22, verse 17. Uh, and the church gathered uh, for special prayer meetings. Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 31. On one occasion, uh, the church prayed for their pastor, Peter, to be delivered from prison. You can read about that in Acts chapter 12. Uh, I preached about it just a couple of months ago. Uh, they prayed and fasted for anointing to be upon missionaries and leaders. Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 13, uh, and Acts chapter 14. Prayer was a priority in every service. They didn't start anything or finish anything without prayer. Prayer should be the first thing you do Prayer should be the last thing you do and everything you do in between. Pray without ceasing. One sign, church sign said that prayer should be our steering wheel, not a spare tire. Prayer. The church, the early church, realized that. They knew prayer was a priority in every service. Paul, in his writings, made several references to his life of unceasing prayer. One example of that is found in Colossians 1 and 9 when he wrote, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Pray for you. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom uh, and spiritual understanding. Can I ask you something? I don't know exactly what Paul's talking about here. He said, but for this cause also, since the day we heard it. Since the day we heard it. See, the difference between Paul and the early church, uh, since the day he heard it, whatever it is, he started praying. For us, we can't wait to get on there and social media and, did you hear about this? Or call somebody else and say, did you, did you hear about this? I just heard this. Did you hear that? Man, Brother Crowley kind of shook that bush a little bit in his message on Friday morning. He said there's too much of this uh, going back. Did you hear and did you hear and this and that? Uh, when the Scripture tells us very clearly what to do uh, from the time that you hear about. If you hear about a brother that's fallen into sin, uh, it's not up to us to go and bl blast out their name. Uh, now, I know I stood on this platform and asked you to pray for two men, but I didn't tell you their name. Uh, I made a prayer request and I kept it uh, just the way I will continue to keep it uh, but if we don't call for prayer uh, who's going to be praying for them uh, so so let that don't let that line be blurred uh, but it's not did you hear what they've done uh, and you haven't talked to God about it uh, there's a difference between calling a prayer force uh, and then running your mouth about somebody Paul said from the time I heard it I started praying some people from the time I heard it I told everybody I could I prayed to Bob, I prayed to Willie, I prayed to John, I prayed. I just let everybody know. Because I remember years, years ago, there used to be a list of names by our phone that had a cord and hung on the wall. Y'all remember those? There was a list of names. And somewhere down that list, I don't remember where we were on it, was Phil and Donna Wyatt. It's called a prayer chain. And when you got the call, hey, pray for such and such, it was your job to call the next person on the chain. And then somewhere along the line, they did away with prayer chains because prayer chains turned into gossip hotlines. So that, that didn't work anymore. Because good Christian folks don't watch soap operas, so they feel like they have to create their own. That's, that's the only conclusion I could come to. But Paul said, when I heard of it, I did not cease to pray for you. 
Have you heard of it? Have you heard it? Have you heard? Anytime you say that, man, people's eyes get big. Their ears perk up. Have you heard? Have you heard? If you have, pray about it. Pray without cease. Whatever you've heard. What, whatever, whatever you've heard about me, pray for me. Pray about it. Pray over that situation and over that circumstance. And that situation, that's what Paul said he did. The priority of prayer is clear, not just through Jesus, not just through the early church, uh, not just in the life of great men of God like Paul, but it's the priority of prayer is clear throughout the Bible. Like the disciples, we're learning about prayer. And we're learning how to make it a priority in our life. Now, some call this, this prayer the Lord's Prayer. It's an outline of prayer, really, is what it is. Some people, that's, that's the prayer. They say, that's the Lord's Prayer, so they pray it, and that's all they pray every day. Our Father, which art in heaven, you know, they go through it, and that's all they pray. But it's an outline. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, this is what he said. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know what happens in heaven? The devil gets thrown out. Right? I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, I prayed for the day. I'm good. That's what some people think. But he said, after this manner, pray. It is an outline of prayer. And I believe last year, might have been COVID year, I can't remember, a while back, I did a series of devotions on the Lord's Prayer. You can find that under the Daily Devotionals tab on Spreaker if you want to. It's episodes 21, I believe, through 29, if it's still on there. I can't remember if it's still on there or not. Telling us and teaching us that that's more, there's more to it than just praying that prayer, just reading those verses. He said that there's, there's meat to be put on those bones. It's like writing a paper. This is your rough draft. This is your outline that you present. And your teacher says, all right, that looks good. Go from there. And that's what we do when we go into prayer. It's like a prayer list. I heard a story one time of a man who had a prayer list. And he would go down that prayer list and he would read the names off their prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. He would just go down that prayer list and he would read it because he, he would have a hard time remembering or whatever. But he would go down that prayer list and he would just begin to read off those names. Uh, he got to a place that all he was doing, he, at first he would pray and he would go in detail uh, and say, Lord, I've heard this. Kind of like Paul, I heard this about this situation and begin to lift him up. Uh, and he would find himself plenty of prayer. And then after a while he found himself just reading off the names. Uh, and after a while he just found himself just laying it on the altar and saying, Lord, you know their, you know their need. You know their need. If we're not careful, that's the way we'll get with the Lord's Prayer. Lord, you know what your prayer says. You know what, it's, you, know what you intend to do. So we, we realize that that's not the case. Here's what Smith Wigglesworth said. Paul's listening now. I said Smith Wigglesworth. I never saw anyone get anything from God who prayed with an earthly focus. If you receive anything from God, you will have to pray into heaven, for the answers are all there. Notice what he said there in, in, his, in the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus led in verse 10, In thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. All the answers are in heaven. It's heaven that we want to answer. When we follow this outline of prayer, we pray God's will be done. We pray for our needs. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for spiritual strength. When we make this blueprint of prayer a daily priority, we will experience an open heaven. How many want that? Scripture says he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we cannot even contain. I want an open heaven in my life, don't you? I want an open heaven in our church. and in our, that we, we understand that there can be an open heaven in our lives and an open heaven in our church. Uh, but get this, there can be an open heaven in the world. He said, thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Not just in the sanctuary, not just in the sanctified life, uh, but he's saying that we can pray that God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. That we can, we, I've heard it said throughout camp meeting uh, that people will turn in this driveway and not even realize why they're doing it. Uh, do you know it's already been happening? It happened Sunday morning. Man's out there, and Brother Paul just finally questioned him on what he's doing here. He said, I just felt a compelling. I I felt like I needed to come to this church. Uh, Listen, uh, that's what priority of praying does, uh, that God can do that, uh, that he will do that when we make this our blueprint. Uh, Can I tell you something else about prayer? Uh, Prayer is our responsibility. It's up to us, church. If the church isn't praying... Who is? And if the church isn't praying, who cares? Because God's not listening to, the only prayer that God's going to listen to from a sinner is the prayer of repentance. They can say, well, I'm talking to the man upstairs. Well, talk all you want. Better say, Lord, forgive me, and then go from there. Prayer is our responsibility. Prayer is our responsibility. It's a responsibility that we shouldn't take lightly. Are we responsible Christian adults? If we're not praying, we're not, right? Paul writes this in his letter to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 8. I exhort, therefore, first of all, first of all, supplications, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks be made of all men. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Well, we already know what's wrong with our country right there. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith. And verily I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. What is he saying? Prayer is our responsibility. Prayer is our responsibility. Do you remember the first time you was given a little bit of responsibility? First time that young adult, maybe, or teenager, or maybe even younger than that, that you was given a little bit of responsibility. What did we do with it? Were we irresponsible? I've always tried to be a responsible person. And anything that I was held responsible for, to do it right. But none more important than the responsibility that I have as a Christian. Not just the preacher, as a pastor. I don't take this responsibility lightly. But also, I don't take the responsibility of being a Christian, an ambassador of Christ. I represent heaven. You represent heaven. We are the representation of Christ in this world. Well, I didn't sign up for that. Well, yeah, kind of you did. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and brag on you. No, glorify your Father. What does that mean? Uh, We're responsible uh, for making sure that the world sees the light of Jesus. Uh, And the only way we can do that uh, is by having access and and that we're tied in uh, and that we're living uh, a life uh, in an open heaven, meaning there's an open line of communication. Back in the old days, they said, we're going to leave this line open. You remember the lady, one ringy-dingy, she'd plug you in. She'd leave that line open, right? Andy Griffin would get that operator on there, Sarah, give me Barney. She'd plug that line in. 
Back as kids, we could get a can, stretch that thing out across the yard with a string in between it. It was an open line. I don't know if you got a string can, you got one ringy dingy, what you have, but can I tell you, we need an open line. There has to be an open line between us and heaven because I need heaven in the midst of my situation. I need heaven to move. There's things that you've got going on I can't do nothing about. Oh, but one man said, I can't take a heart that's broken and make it over again, but I know a man who can. And if I know my father, he'll do it for you just like he did for me. Give me a minute. Let me give him a call. Give me a second. Let me call on him, and let's see what he'll do for you. My boss was telling me the other day we were working, and he said, there has to be more. He's been going to a church for 10 years, and it's one of the mega churches in our area. He was a campus pastor at one time. He said, I've just come to the conclusion. He said, I'm just kind of in that place, and I'm like, there has to be more than just inviting people to church. He said, there has to be more to this thing. He was raised independent Baptist, and for his first experience of any kind of Pentecost is a church that calls them non, themselves non-denominational spirit-filled. And so they're, they're putting a little bit of the emphasis there. And I know his pastor. I'm like, man, your pastor didn't tell you about this? Uh, he, I mentioned camp meeting. He said, what's that? I said, your pastor was a camp meeting preacher when he was in the church of God. He never told you about it. No, he may, he may have, but I didn't. But anyway, here's what he was saying. He said, I've got a friend by the name of Christian. He said, I was showing him around the building the other day. I said, Christian, man, he's just, he's just out there in his faith. He's just kind of just, there, there's no, no shame in it. He said, we were standing here, I was showing him around, and we got to talking to the painter, and the painter began to tell him how he was having some heart issues, and he was telling me that, and Christian was there, and he said, Christian just stopped the whole conversation and said, listen, I like to pray for people. You mind if I pray for you? He said, Jamie, he prayed for him right here. He pointed to this spot. Right here in this bill, he just stopped everything we was doing, uh, uh, took that man by the hand, uh, and prayed for him right here in the building. Uh, and he said the next day, uh, the painter came back in uh, and said, I don't know who that guy was that was in here yesterday, uh, but when he touched me, uh, when he started praying, uh, he said, I felt something. Uh, and he said, I went to the doctor yesterday afternoon. Uh, he said, my heart is already improving. Uh, I don't know who he is. Uh, you know what that was uh, he had an open line to heaven uh, he had an, uh, it didn't have to wait till he got here uh, he had an open line right there uh, in the middle of that business it wasn't even open for business yet uh, God was open for business and he had an access to the open heaven why because he said prayer is my responsibility prayer is my responsibility he didn't look at that man and say hey if you pray God will heal you he said it's my responsibility to pray for you if I'm presented with a need and I see that you have a need, I have a responsibility now. In closing tonight, we've we got a lot more that we're going to cover in this series. We just came out of camp meeting. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time. But if we're going to have a revival that impacts this modern society, we must make prayer a priority. Camp meetings are great, but camp meeting services won't do it. Believe it or not, my preaching can't do it. The greatest singing cannot do it. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take prayer. Prayer is going to make preaching more effective. Prayer is going to make our singing more effective because the anointing is the difference. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But, if we're going to impact our society, it's going to be through the priority of prayer. When we make prayer our priority, God said he would pour out his spirit. Jeremiah 33 and 3, call unto me, and I'll get back with you later. No. Call unto me, and I will answer thee. I don't know about you, but that's enough for me. 
That's all I ask when I call somebody is answer the phone. Right? Just answer. That's good. That's a good starting point. But he didn't stop there. He said, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's a call I'm glad I made. Because all I was expecting uh, many times when I pray is, Lord, are you out there? You ever been there? Where are you, Lord? He said, I'm right here, and I'm fixing to show you something. I'm fixing to show you my glory. If you'll call unto me, I'll answer you, and I'll show you great and mighty things. Uh, I'm going to show you that something you don't know. Uh, I'm going to reveal some things uh, that you've never, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Uh, God said, if you'll just call unto me. He, he didn't ask much unto us. He just asked, there's just three letters, three words there. Call unto me. God said, if you'll pray, I'll do the rest. Prayer is hard. Oh, prayer is easy. We just call upon God say, here I am, Lord. It's me again. Got another problem I can't solve. I messed something up again. I, I've got a situation. Or how about this? Hey, Lord, I just wanted to say hello. Just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate you. Have you ever called somebody just to tell them, hey, I just want to let you know I appreciate you. Lord, I just want to let you know I love you. Who was the guy who wrote, I just called to say I love you? Stevie Wonder. He couldn't see a thing. I just called to say I love you. I've just called. And the Lord said, if you'll do that, I'll answer you. Lord said, you love me? I love you too. Here. Pour out a blessing you can't contain. See, God loves like nobody can love. God is love. God is love. And so we see as we begin to call upon him, he said he'll show us great and mighty things. So just stand with me tonight. I'm done. It's not a 15-minute closing. I'm done. I've talked about the priority of prayer, so why don't we make prayer a priority in these altars tonight? As we gather in these altars, we commit ourselves to the priority of prayer. Just ask the Lord to make his presence known in your life. Ask you to begin that process of transformation into Christ's likeness in you, in me, in us. Lord, bring the transformation. H have you ever asked yourself, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? Just be honest. And, and more times than not, I've looked at some of y'all and said, what's wrong with him? Look at co-workers. What's wrong with them? Trip through Walmart. You'll say, what's wrong with them? Right? What's wrong with us? Lord, start that process of transformation of Christ's likeness for each one of us. Don't we want to see a transformation in this world? Well, it starts right here. He said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. But more importantly, do this to yourself. Do it. It starts right here. Know you not that you're the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Say it tonight. Prayer is my priority. Prayer is my responsibility. Do you take res your responsibilities lightly? No. So let's gather in these altars and let's say, Lord, begin that transformation. Begin that transformation. Can I tell you, church, when we do this, when we make this a priority, we're going to see things happen. Father, we gather in these altars tonight, making prayer priority number one. It may have been down our list, but it's moved to the top tonight. Prayer is the key. And faith unlocks the door touch us tonight. Transform our minds, our hearts, and our lives, and our church. In Jesus' name.